we started getting music, I go, Pachish. It's the first Methodist. Okie dokie. Well, I think I hit her, hit her, uh, I can't think of the word, but I hit her style or playing, I think, <laughs> with one of those. I really, this is my first one. Oh, like oh yeah, when I bought her style that, of playing. That frame, frame, frame. Yeah. She's Joe talking Rain's about her style I mean, this stuff, we talked about
to tell you, I am privileged. I get to be introduced in such a way with music. <laughs> I am honored. They call that walk-up music. <laughs> and I'm ready to walk on up, brother. <laughs> Welcome. Good morning to you all, and the Lord Christ be with you. My name is Vanessa Lawson, and I am one of the members here. And it's my honor to welcome you, each of you, here in the sanctuary to Mayfield First. We are so glad to join you today. We also want to welcome each of you who are our radio listeners at WYMC and people watching on Facebook. If you are watching through Facebook, then you can let us know that you're there in the comment section. If you need a prayer request, put it in the comment section. We want to hear from you. We value the hearing from you. Now we want to say in a special prayer for the COVID-19 illness, for the tornado victims, for Kate Cox, for Hope Smith, and Fran Conley. And of course, we want to keep each and every one of you in prayer, both here and listening on the radio and on Facebook. We want to lift up two of our churches in the Purchase District. This week's churches are Lebanon United Methodist Church and Massac United Methodist Church. And the, right, the Reverend John Smith Marr, the candle on your right, is lit to represent the folks and the pastor at these churches. We ask that you please keep them in your thoughts and your prayers. And we know you will then carry them close to our heart. Now we want to do some shout outs. We want to shout out to Leslie Tao. We hope you're doing well. We love you and we miss you. We want to do a shout out to the Needline Food Pantry. This is an organization that provides food to individuals, families, and senior citizens in need. If you or someone you know might qualify for need lines, please, you can contact them or call the church office and we will give you the information for that. We want to shout out to Integrity Group. The Integrity Group is a consulting company helping with tornado relief and navigating the recovery process in our community. A big thank you to them and all of their help during this time. Now we are so glad you chose to come and worship with us this morning. We want you to take an opportunity to remind you that worship is what we do. Worship comes from the heart. Worship is the spirit that Christ that moves within us. It ain't something you watch. It ain't something you get from somebody else. Together, we are here to pray, to glorify, to give thanks to God through Jesus Christ for all the benefits and blessings that the life that he has given us, we have. Let's remember that. Now, our opening prayer to worship is for all of us to pray. The words are printed in your bulletin. And please say these with us. Lord of light and life, Amen. you have called us this day to open our hearts, our minds, our spirit to hear your words. Encouragement, healing, and hope. Give us patience and willingness to serve you in all that we do. It's just aim. Amen. All right, let's stand. Sing our first hymn. Turn to number 578 as we sing the first, second, and fourth verses of God of Love and God of Power.
Now, would you please join me in the prayer of elimination, which is found in your bulletin? <laughs> Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and all the few and secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and that worthy magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you. To today's soldiers. Sorry about that. Too many pages turned. It's taken from Isaiah, the fifth chapter, verses one through seven. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning this vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and he hewed out a wine vat in it. He expected it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now inhabitants of Jerusalem and people of Judah judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done it? When I expected it to yield grapes, why did it yield white grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedges and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall and it shall be trampled down. I will make of it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed. It shall be overgrown with briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the people of Judah are its pleasant planning. He expected justice, but saw bloodshed, righteousness, but heard a cry. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus Christ, who was and is and is to come. My name is Joey Reed. I'm privileged to be the pastor here at Mayfield First United Methodist Church. We come now to a time of silent prayer, followed by a pastoral prayer, and then the Lord's Prayer. The silent prayer is a chance for you to listen very carefully for what it is that God may be saying to you in these moments, and it's also a chance for you to say those things that no one else needs to hear yet, either because you're keeping a confidence or because you just don't have the words to say it out loud, even to God, just yet. God hears our groanings and turns those words, or turns those groanings into words that God can understand so that God can hear and answer our cries. The Lord's Prayer will follow the pastoral prayer, and I invite you to pray that along with me. Let us go to God now in silent prayer. God, we give you thanks for this day and for the chance to worship you in it. We give you thanks for the word that comes to us from your prophet Isaiah, even though those words give us pause, or at least should. We give thanks for your temper, as strange as it is to say out loud, O God, because it is through your righteousness and the wrath that comes as a result that we know that we have done you wrong and we have an opportunity to change our ways. Best of all, O God, we give thanks for the grace that you offer to us so that our sins might be forgiven, that when we make those missteps, O God, there is a way back to your good favor. We ask now, O Lord, that in the midst of these difficult times that you would teach us where we have made mistakes and that you would help us to see that sometimes 
The difficulties that we face are a result of the way the world works rather than the result of your wrath being poured out upon us. Help us to know the difference. Help us to understand when we have made you upset. Help us to understand when we have stepped away from what you have called us to do. Help us to understand especially how we might do those things that you have asked of us, not just for the sake of keeping you happy, but for the sake of righteousness. We pray all of these things in the name of the living Christ who not only brought us forgiveness for our sins, but taught us what we needed to do, what we needed to say, and who we were supposed to be, that we might be called the people of God. He gave these these words to his disciples, and we echo them today as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our next scripture reading will come from Psalms 80, so Solster, verses 1 and 2, and then 8 through 19, and can be found in the hymnal on page 801. Your part will be in bold. Verses 1 and 2 reads, Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who are enthroned upon the cherub and shine forth in the presence of Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh. Stir up your might and come to save us. Okay, and then we go to verse 8. Verse 8 says, You brought a vine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. The mountains were covered with its shade, the mighty cedars with its branches. Why then have you broken down its walls so that all who pass along the way plucks its fruit. The Lord, the Lord scratches it, and all that Turn again, O God of hosts, look down from heaven and see. They have burned it with fire, they have cut it down. May they perish at the rebuke of their consonants. Then we will never turn back from you. Give us life, and we will call on your name. All right, let's stand once again as we turn to number 712. I sing a song of the saints of God, all three verses.
Our next scripture reading is from Hebrews 11, chapter, verses 29 through chapter 12, verse 2. By the faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as if it were dry land. But when the Egyptians attempted to do so, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had received the spies in peace. And what more should I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Japheth, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the raging fire, escaped the edge of the sword, won strength out of weakness, because mighty in war put foreign armies to flight. Women received their dead by resurrection. Others were tortured, refusing to accept release in order to obtain a better resurrection. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned to death. They were sawn in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, persecuted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and in holes in the ground. Yet... All these, though they were commended for their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better so that they would not, apart from him, he made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely. Let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross and disregarding his shame has taken the seat at the right hand of the throne of God. The grass wither and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord endures forever. We come now to a time of offering, a time of giving back to God that which God has given to us. All good things come to us through the blessing and benefit of God's almighty hand, and we give back to God a portion of those things that we have received. So I want to remind you during this time of offering, it's not just about our finances. It's about some of the gifts that we have received, some of the, the abilities that we have. It's a chance for us to offer to God the things that God has given to us for the use of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Let me tell you a little bit about some of the finances that uh, we have. There are all kinds of things that are being done here in the life of the church that are for tornado survivors. Most of that is coming out of funds that came from outside of the church. We still have uh, obligations for what we use here in this building. Uh, we are the guests of Christ United Methodist Church, but we're still responsible for a portion of the utilities, and we are responsible for a portion of the, uh, the things that need to be done so that we can continue to take care of survivors. We have the staff salaries that we take care of. We have a variety of things that we have to purchase and a variety of things that we have to rent or otherwise use for not just the purposes of worship, but for the purposes of Jesus Christ and his ongoing kingdom. So it is to that general fund that I'm asking you to be faithful. If you are a member here and you have made your covenant to be supportive of those things that happen here, now is your chance to contribute financially to those things. And if you are a guest here and you are trying to find a way to honor God, you can make an offering here today that will also honor God. If you're here in the sanctuary and not listening online or on the radio, there's a way that you can give that is simple and easy. You simply find the offering box that's at the front of the sanctuary or at the back of the sanctuary and leave your offering there. If you, are, if you prefer to do it online, you can use mayfieldfirst.com and click on the giving tab and leave your offering with us there. 
There's also a way that we're still trying to figure out how it works, but we are assured that it is effective because we have seen its results. You can text the word GIVE with a dollar amount to the telephone number 364-999-4480. And you can also mail any gift that you have to Mayfield First United Methodist Church, Post Office Box 766, Mayfield, Kentucky, 42066. Over the past few weeks, we have seen an increased number of folks who are in need of the help that the church is offering, and we have seen a great increase in the amount of hours that the church staff is spending helping to take care of those folks. If you would like to be a part of that process, carrying someone to the grocery store or taking someone uh, shopping to, to purchase new clothing or to, to refurbish the, the items that they lost in the, in the storm, uh, some folks are still moving into new places, and we have folks who are taking them to make those, those shopping trips, if you will. If you're able to do something along those lines, would you give Cindy a call in the church office and let her know that you are available? You can also just drop by, and we might have a job for you waiting as you arrive. But in all these things, we are asking of each other to be faithful to God, to give back to God some of the things that we have received, whether it's our time or our talents, our gifts, our service, our witness, our finances. It's a chance for us to be faithful. So as we sing the words of the doxology, would you make it clear in your heart that that's what you wish to be, faithful? Stand as we sing this song. for the reading of the gospel. Today's gospel comes from the gospel according to St. Luke, the 12th chapter, verses 49 through 56. I'm reading, as usual, from the New Revised Standard Version. Jesus is speaking, and he says, I came to bring fire to the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. I have a baptism with which to be baptized, and what a stress I am under until it is completed. Do you think that I have come to bring peace to the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. From now on, five in one household will be divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided, father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. He also said to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, you immediately say, it's going to rain. And so it happens. And when you see the south wind blowing, you say, there will be scorching heat. And it happens. You hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of earth and sky, but why do you not know how to interpret the present time? This is the word of God for you who are the people of God. Thanks be to God. It began with a song. The year was 1977. I was sitting in the back seat of my parents' car. I was going to turn six that year. And on the screen, a flourish of trumpets, a fanfare, a song that would come to be known 
as the beginning of something that was going to be wonderful every time I heard it. We were at the drive-in in Madison, Tennessee, and we were watching one of the first screenings at a drive-in theater of Star Wars. I know, right? Buckley knew as soon as I said 77. He was back there humming the song, and I'm like, oh, can't ever get anything past him. It began with a song. I heard music as I looked out the window of the cafeteria at Lambeth University, and I saw a cute blonde girl walking towards me down the sidewalk. I don't remember the name of the song. I don't remember the words of the song, but I remember that there was a phrase in there that I would soon say to her, and she would say to me, I do. It began with a song. I won't tell you what year that was. You can do the math and figure all that stuff out for you. Today's lectionary began with a song. And this song is not one that is sad, but it became sad. As you read through what this song is about, it's a popular song from the time of Isaiah and before. It's a song about a beautiful vineyard. It's a song about how nature brings forth the, the product of the vine. It's a song about how when you take care of something, it produces fruit. And yet, just a few lines into the song, Isaiah stops singing. And he starts the complaint. Because he is speaking on behalf of God. He's speaking on behalf of God when he says, Now, inhabitants of Jerusalem and people of Judah, why don't you judge what's happened between me and my vineyard? What more was there to do for my vineyard than I have not done in it? He goes on to talk about how the wild grapes that were produced were not fit for what was intended. He goes on to talk about what will happen to the vineyard. I will remove its hedge and it will be devoured. I will break down its wall and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed and it shall be overgrown with briars and thorns. And I'll command the clouds to rain no rain upon it. This is not a happy vintner. This is not a happy song. Not anymore. We move to the Psalter and we hear the same sorts of complaints, but this time they come from the people. We hear the people of God asking how much longer it will be that the rain does not fall from the clouds. How much longer will it be before the hedge grows back up around the vineyard? How much longer before God withdraws God's wrath? We don't like to talk about God's wrath. We don't like to talk about God withholding God's gracious forbearance. We don't like to talk about an absence of God's mercy. It makes us nervous. Because too many people in our lives have used that wrath to make people think that if they didn't get scared straight, they would burn in hell for the rest of their days. But I'm here to tell you that there is a direct correlation and causality between the way we act, the way we speak, the way we are as human beings. And it takes more than our faith to establish the kingdom of God in this place. And if you have read the end and you understand how this story comes to a conclusion, that kingdom is coming here. And we are being asked to participate in its arrival and in the preparation that goes into allowing that kingdom to exist here in this place. We are products of the vineyard. We are bearing the fruit that God is asking of us. But every once in a while, we should be asking ourselves, are we bearing the fruit that we are supposed to bear, or are we just bearing enough to get by? And in some cases, we have to ask, are we even bearing fruit? There are many, many times in the course of the ministry that I've been privileged to, to be a part of, the United Methodist Church, that I've looked around to see that we're not doing nearly as much as we could be doing. I saw, I saw a wonderful meme on social media. It was about football or maybe baseball. It wasn't clear. 
and it said something along the lines of there is in most communities a small group of people who know how to play every play to move the ball in the direction it needs to go to perform every athletic feat that has ever been accomplished perfectly to understand the strategy of every game that has ever been played but the problem is you see we can well we can't get that person to put down his popcorn and come down out of the stands to actually participate to get that thing done sometimes I feel that way in the church sometimes I've been the guy with the popcorn and sometimes I've been the coach on the sidelines and sometimes I've been the guy at the bottom of the pile I've looked around to see what bishops are doing and I've had a few thoughts about that and I've realized I don't know what they're bearing I've questioned the decisions of cabinets district superintendents missionaries and I've realized sometimes way too late I don't know what they're bearing and I've realized that in those moments I have taken the opportunity to lay down my hoe and to ignore my section of the vineyard and to allow wild grapes to be produced where I'm standing how may we hope for redemption because of God's good grace how may we hope for God's good grace by the fact of Jesus's coming to show us what it looks like to do what we are supposed to do and to be who we are supposed to be how are we able to stand up from our sins to be who we are supposed to be because of Jesus's own death and resurrection through that atonement we are given the opportunity to be forgiven of those sins those moments when we laid down the hoe or worse when we took our implement and we wrecked the garden intentionally or unintentionally you see redemption is not just an easy peasy kind of thing that happens whether we want it to or not redemption requires faithfulness redemption requires that we look to the author and perfecter of our salvation and we do as he did as best we can well that was Jesus he's the son of God he is the divine and yet he looked to his disciples and said you will do all of these things that I have done and you will do greater things as a matter of fact that's one of our bishops favorite phrases there's a song that goes with it and he likes to have it played sometimes he begins with a song so we look then to the next passage in our lectionary for today and we see that there have been many who were faithful many who did what they could and died as a result of what they were doing sometimes slaughtered by beasts thrown to the lions killed by gladiators crucified for their troubles boiled in oil there are all kinds of stories of faith for those who have been given the faithfulness to stand in the face of empire and say not empire but kingdom and the kingdom looks like this it looks like one who is willing to lay down his or her life for the needs of those who cannot or will not do for themselves just as Jesus laid down his life for those of us who could not and in some cases would not do for themselves I see those see those stories of faithfulness and how those people did what they did the physical fatigue the spiritual fatigue we've talked about spiritual burnout we've talked about compassion burnout with all of the helping that we do and all of the scamming that we see it's it's a joy I have to tell you when someone comes to us with with a sincere heart and has a need that is greater than they can imagine and they don't really think that there might be help but they are holding on to faith they are holding on to hope and when we offer them a little bit of that hope just a smidgen of what they had dared to expect their joy overflows and I have to tell you that it makes it worthwhile to put up with some of those other folks that we have seen 
There are all kinds of rules that we have to follow because of FEMA. There are all kinds of rules that go into place because of insurance. There are all kinds of rules that we follow even as the long-term recovery group to ensure that the recovery for each person that we touch is, is fair and equitable. But there are times when the need is so great and what we can provide is so small that we can't see any other response than anger and frustration. And yet, time and again, we are offered gratitude, sometimes in a language we can't understand because English is not their first language. Physical fatigue, spiritual fatigue. And then we come to the gospel reading and we start to think, oh, well, here's where Jesus is going to step in and make it all right and tell us everything's going to be better. And instead, Jesus gives us the hard answer that there are no easy answers. How many of you were brought to faith with easy answers? How many of you were told that all you have to do is say the right thing and believe the right thing and come to the altar, kneel at the chancel, surrender your life to God, and everything would be perfect from there on out? When I came running to the chancel rail at a very young age, I believed that promise. And I have come to understand in times since that the life of a disciple is not always easy. It sometimes requires hard work. It sometimes requires more of me than I'm willing to give. It often requires more of me than I'm able to give. But I've been told after many years of trying to listen to folks who are smarter than I am, that it is exactly in those moments that God's glory can be seen. Because we are able to accomplish more than what we should be able to do. Because of what God gives to us, because of what God provides for us, because of what God sends through us, through the power of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus Christ, the Spirit that has been offered to us, Again and again, I am told, no, preacher, that's not how it works. It's faith, not works, that provides us with our salvation. I would say to you and to them, you've got the timeline all mixed up. Salvation is what comes to us as a result of our faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus provides every bit of that. But salvation means wholeness. Salvation means that we have been made whole. We have been redeemed. We have been drawn up out of the miry clay and we have had our feet set up on the rock where we now have purchased to stand. And when I'm talking about work, when I'm talking about faithfulness, I'm talking about what you do from that point on. Harry Emerson Fosdick wrote The Meaning of Prayer many years ago. And he quotes the mystic, Meister Eckhart. God can as little do without us as we without him. Let me read that again, because the first time I read it, I thought I had misunderstood. These words are not possible. God can as little do without us as we without him. Fosdick goes on to say, If at first this seems a wild statement, we may well consider in how many ways... God's will depends on human cooperation. God cannot do some things unless people think. He never blazons his truth on the sky that people may find it without seeking. Only when people gird their loins, the loins of their minds, and undiscourageably give themselves to intellectual toil will God reveal to them the truth, even about the physical world. And God cannot do some things unless people work. Whew, Harry Emerson Fosdick, you're out on a thin branch, my brother. But listen to what he says. Will a person say that when God wants bridges and tunnels, when God wants the lightnings harnessed and the cathedrals built, that he will do the work himself. Huh. Fosdick drives the point home with this sentence, and it's one that I hear in my mind 
on a fairly regular basis. That is an absurd and idle fatalism. God stores the hills with marble, but he never built the Parthenon. He fills the mountains with ore, but he never made a needle or a locomotive. Only when people work can some things be done. Recall then the words of Stradivarius, the maker of violins, interpreted by George Eliot. When any master holds between chin and hand a violin of mine, he will be glad that Stradivari lived, made violins, and made them of the best. For while God gives them skill, I give them instruments to play upon, God choosing me to help him. If my hand slacked, I should rob God, since he is fullest good, leaving a blank, a void, where a violin might have been. Now, if God has left some things contingent upon humanity's thinking and working, why may he not have left some things contingent upon the prayers of God's people? The testimony of the great souls is a clear affirmative to this. Some things never without thinking, some things never without working, and some things never without praying. Let me be clear. Harry Emerson Fosdick is not saying that God is incapable. God is saying to us through passages like the Isaiah passage, through the Psalms passage, and through both of the New Testament lectionaries, that we have an obligation to cooperate with God. And that there is an expectation that we will lift the hand, that we will at some point strain our minds, at some point that we will bend the knee, thinking, working, and praying. This has been a part of my devotional life for some years now, going on decades. <laughs> And yet when I come to that one, it's hard for me to reconcile. Because we think of redemption as something that God does. And that that's the end of the story. But why are you redeemed, friends? To what end? For what purpose? Why are you made whole? It is so that you can work and will and pray in this world, so as to make visible the kingdom of Jesus Christ, so that you can reach a hand out to the person who was once or who is in the place where you once were. To many of my colleagues in a variety of denominations, including the United Methodist Church, have told us that all we need to do is pray a prayer and sit a pew. And it's so much more than that. If you have any doubts about the work of the kingdom, if you have any doubts about how hard it is to bring this to bear in a world that doesn't want it sometimes, I invite you to lay aside your popcorn and to remind me to do the same. For when I have grave misgivings about the way things are done or who's doing what or why they are doing what they do, I need to remember that I have taken the time to lay down my working implement to become a critic instead of a worker in the vineyard. Jesus reminds us that choosing God will cause division. Jesus reminds us that there will be moments when we look to the skies and know what the weather's going to do. When we look to the south, in Jesus' case, that's where the desert was. And when the winds came from the south, it was going to be a scorcher. We've been very mindful of the weather here lately, have we not? I've been thinking about it every time I heard a peal of thunder or saw a flash of lightning. I was already very much into the radar that was available online and interpreting those models, and I listen more closely than ever to some of our meteorological friends because I want to know what the weather is going to do. By that same token, Jesus called out to his disciples, and he calls out to us, interpret the signs of the times. See those needs, my fellow United Methodist, 
and do what our forebears did for centuries, meet those needs. And if you ever wonder that you are enough, if you ever have a single doubt that you might be sufficient to the task that God has laid before you, I would point you to two people. To Peter, who, as you may well remember, only opened his mouth to change feet. Yeah. And I would point you to myself. The mistakes that I've made, the moments that I've missed, the opportunities that I've let go by because I did not recognize them as such. And I would encourage you with these words, if Peter can do it, so too can you. And if I've made it this long in a pulpit with a stole around my neck and nobody strung me up or told me I needed to go sell cars for a living instead, you can do this too. It might not be the preaching task, but it will definitely be the task that involves your sacrifice, your self-giving, that comes from a place that we know as redemption, where God has drawn you up out of that miry mud and clay and put your feet upon the rock so that you have traction, so that you have purchase, so that you have leverage. Make a difference, you who are redeemed. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Will you pray with me? Lord, our brokenness in memory cries out to us and tells us that we are broken still. Sing your song of love over us. Remind us that our discipleship too began with a song. A song of your love for us, a song of your expectation, a song of your redemption. And as we look to the future to see what it is that we might do about that future, to bring nearer the kingdom and to draw near those who have never heard of such a thing, Strengthen us for tasks that are well beyond our human capabilities, frailties, and failings. And let us be found boldly marching toward the vineyard to do what work we can so that you may accomplish what work you will in us, through us, around us, for the sake of Jesus Christ. Amen. The invitation may be clearer today than it has been. If you've never followed after Jesus in your life and you are looking for that redemption that will allow you a place to stand, then I invite you to the chancel rail to meet with this Savior, to understand what it means to be saved and to give your life to Jesus. If you gave your life to Jesus at some point, but you did it on the terms of the world, some sort of easy transactional agreement that took your sins away and allowed you to do whatever you wanted to do from that point on, I would invite you to come and give to God what you've been holding back and to receive from God that mandate to work alongside the rest of the workers in the vineyard. If you are a part of another congregation and God's calling you to this one, I would understand if you had second thoughts after today's sermon. But before you join this one, leave well. Say what needs to be said to the pastor and to the congregation of, of that place and let them know that the Spirit has led you to this one. And at that point, in that time, I would welcome you into worship and into service as a member of this congregation. And finally, for those who are simply trying to get more questions answered. You may have more today before you leave than you've had in your life. But use this time of dedication. Listen for the words of the hymn and recognize that it is near the cross that we will find not only our salvation and redemption, but our marching orders as well. As we stand to sing, would you make your dedication before Almighty God?
The sermon said what the sermon said because this Wednesday we will say what we are going to say about who it is that we are going to be. If you'll remember, if you participated in the last listening session, we talked about all the things that we wanted to do and we got stuck on the place where we asked the question, and now who's going to do it? It was a difficult session. When we come again to that listening session, I will not be leading it. I have invited my friend, your friend, the Reverend Dr. Johnny Jeffords to come in and to be a a fair arbiter of what it is that we say so that I don't have my thumb on the scales, so that he has an ability to listen to what you are saying, to what you are committing to, so that as we go forward, we have something to share with an architect in the next few days, the next few weeks or months. But it will be all about who we are called to be and how faithful we are in responding. Because though it's been said many times that Jesus is our personal Savior, that is true. Jesus is also the Savior of a community of faith. And how we work together in that community of faith will determine the success of our congregation, our willingness to work with our fellow members of the body of Christ in other congregations, regardless of their denominational status. Be thinking about this. And if that casts the sermon in a slightly different light, I'm okay with that. God's forgiveness isn't as personal as we sometimes make it out to be. It took Jesus to show us that we must decide who it is that we're going to worship, who it is that we're going to serve, and to recognize that not everyone will choose wisely. Speak the words of the benediction to one another, recognizing that we go out into the world, a world that is filled with brokenness, but we bring hope. We bring a new way of being, a new Savior to serve, and the understanding that Jesus empowers us to make a difference wherever we go. The words are there in your bulletin. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness and protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. Go in peace to serve your neighbor and thus serve your king. Amen.